Welcome to First Southern. We're so glad that you're here with us today. And we hope that through today's service that you grow in your relationship, in your journey with Jesus. If you'd like to get connected with us, there are a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, You can either go to our website and go to the contact us page, or you can always take out your device and text the word connects to 94000. We'll have somebody reach out to you and we would love to connect with you, answer questions you may have, uh, maybe even set up a coffee or a lunch to sit down and get to know you better. Now, we would also love to connect with you here online uh, through today's service. And so go over right now to the chat section and drop us a good morning, hello, something along those lines, and let us know that you're there. We have somebody standing by that is looking forward to discussing today's worship and prayer and message. Uh, So why don't you go ahead and do that now? Now, will you join me as we go to the Lord in worship?
Let us join with all of heaven singing holy. Singing holy. And cry out holy. And singing holy. And holy. be magnified. Our creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry and from north to south and east to west we hear Christ be magnified were the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountaintops, we hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified.
returning glory of all the angels and the saints. My heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. in me oh Christ be magnified the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me what an amazing time of worship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now will you join me as we transition to worshiping the Lord through music into worshiping the Lord through prayer. Join me as we pray. Almighty God, thank you. We are so grateful for all of the blessings that you continually pour out into our lives. We're thankful for who you are, that you are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful, unchanging Savior of the world. You are the creator, the Alpha and Omega. And there is no one greater than you. You are the one true living God. And for these things, for these reasons, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. You alone deserve it. And Lord, Despite the fact that you are all powerful and all present and all, all knowing, you are also loving. Lord, you love us so much that you sent your one and only unique son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth and die for our sins. And so, Lord, we thank you today for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that we could be forgiven and that we could be in connection with you. Lord, in light of that, you have forgiven us so much and we pray today, right now, that you would forgive us of our sins and in turn, out of the immense, immeasurable forgiveness that you've poured into our lives, Lord, that we would also in turn forgive others. So Lord, thank you so much. We pray for your guidance, for your direction in all the aspects of our lives. And Lord, lastly, we thank you for who you are and how you care for us. Lord, I know that many watching right now may be going through difficult times. And I pray, Lord, that today you would surround them, that you would bring them peace and comfort, that you would give them strength, both physically, spiritually, and mentally. Lord, and that you would provide where, where provision is needed, that you would provide for their needs. But ultimately, no matter what's going on in our lives, what situations we find ourselves in, Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength to glorify you and point people to you, that we would lead every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus. So Lord, we pray that you will help us to do that today, tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, and for the rest of our lives. Lead us to be people that lead others to you. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Greetings, First Southern family. This is Josh Madison again. Happy to be able to uh, be with you remotely. This week, I'm recording the message actually from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm at the church at West Franklin, uh, just south of Nashville, and they were kind enough to let me record the message 
uh, in their sanctuary. And it's really kind because as you can see from everything behind me, it's uh, VBS week for them and a lot of things are going on, but I was able to sneak in here and uh, record the message today and I'm excited to be able to do it. I, I love VBS and VBS is one of these opportunities that you get to kind of help uh, teach the Bible in these creative ways and get kids to kind of pretend and play along. And here the, the idea here is this uh, uh, archaeological dig in something like ancient Egypt, which is pretty cool because uh, just last week I was in Egypt and I was able to see some excavations and sites from different periods and things they had been digging. And so here I'm on a pretend set and there I was in a real set, if you will, uh, all the way over there in Egypt. And it gets me thinking about the text that we have today, because we're going to be talking about a kind of pretending, but it's not a good one. So if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 4, we'll be in verses 32, Acts 4, 32, through chapter 5, verse 11. Uh, we're picking up where we left off last week, where Pastor Josh left us off last week in chapter 4. Uh, if, if I can just remind you what's going on here in the book of Acts, which again is a continuation of the gospel story that Luke began to tell in his gospel, the gospel according to Luke. The second volume to his work is the Acts of the Apostles. So really, Luke and Acts are meant to be read together. And Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament as you go through. So we're in Acts chapter 4, and so far what we've seen is Jesus ascends to heaven in Acts chapter 1. The disciples obey Jesus and go back to Jerusalem. There's 120 of them. They're waiting uh, for something to happen, and something happens. The Holy Spirit comes down and fills them, and all of a sudden there's this boldness of the apostles and the church starts growing and it even starts being persecuted and it starts to really gain a reputation. And it's pretty cool stuff. But as great as everything is going, some reality checks are about to happen. And we're gonna see that in just a moment. So look with me in Acts chapter four, starting in verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart, and one and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had, had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, 
Father, we thank you for this story, Lord. What a reminder, God, that you see past all of the things that we normally get fixated on. You see right down into our hearts and you care. You care about what's going on in our hearts. You care about our community. Lord, help us to hear the warning you have here. Help us to listen and pay attention to what you have to say to your church. Because your church, Lord, even at your, the healthiest moment, is always in peril of something in the human heart that needs the grace of God. So help us to hear your warning and help us to run to your grace today. And we thank you for this, this word, this story, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is going on here? I mean, things were going so well, and now all of a sudden, there's a man and a wife dead. And it's, they're not dead because they were walking around uh, boasting or criticizing the leadership. or They're not dead because they weren't cooperating with the outreach of the church. They weren't dead because they were trying to do something uh, to other people that was just totally terrible. This man and this wife are dead because of something secret that they were keeping that no one else knew about, but God did. And revealed it to Peter. And it's pretty amazing when you start to think about it. And in fact, as you read the story, a lot of people come to the story, especially if it's kind of the first time you've heard the story, and you think, well, wow, God's striking a couple dead for this. This is a very, it seems a little over severe, isn't it? Well, let's just back up and talk about for a minute what's, what is going on here in this story. Well, <clears throat> the church is growing, and uh, the people are gathering together and they're taking care of one another. They're doing what a community of believers ought to do. They're looking out for each other. And people are being very generous. Again, Jesus has just ascended into heaven. Uh, great things are happening on the ground in Jerusalem in this church. I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, well, the end is surely near because of all these signs and wonders and amazing things. And so they're like, you know, let's not live for this world anymore. Let's get serious about the kingdom. And so you, it's when you hear about stories about someone like a Barnabas uh, selling his land and, and in this ceremony of, of uh, generosity, contributing it to the church so that people can be taken care of. There was no welfare in that day, but the church was there to help people who'd fallen on hard times. And so here's this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they have real estate, they have property, and they, they sell it. And they take the proceeds and they also contributed in this ceremony of generosity. But the reality is that from the actual total amount of what they sold, they, they held a portion back and they reported a false amount. So let's use our dollars today. Let's imagine that someone had a house and some property in Scottsdale and they sold it for $350,000. Um, and they decided to give to the church and yet they sold it for $350,000. That's what they got for the sale. But then they announced that they had sold it for $340,000. And they came and they contributed $340,000 to First Southern of Scottsdale. We'd all be like, wow, look at this couple sold their house in there. They're giving it to the church. That's so the proceeds to the church. No one would have been the wiser that the couple actually had held back $10,000 of that whole sale. It's just $10,000. The problem is, is that they weren't honest about how much it was really sold for. And they were giving it in this way as if they were giving the whole amount. You see, it's interesting. I've given you kind of some numbers to think about. $350,000 sale, but they announced it was three hundred forty, dollars and they secretly keep ten. dollars uh, The Bible doesn't tell us in this story how much the property was sold for or how much was held back. Let's say that it was sold for $350,000 and they gave only $10,000 and kept $340,000 back. What if they only get, they kept $5,000 back? The point is it didn't matter. Even if they had held back 1% and told everybody that it was the 99% was the whole amount and they gave the 99%, they still were misrepresenting themselves. They were still lying 
about what they were doing. Now, what was the problem with that? Why is that such a serious infraction that God would strike them dead? That's what we have to think about today. You see, the, the Luke, the one who's writing this story by the inspiration of God, God is telling us through this story that Luke is writing that trying to be something you're not is more than just foolishness. It actually can be very dangerous. Now, why is that? How is that? It seems like a minor sin, a small sin, and yet God deals with it very severely. So this morning, what I want to do is really answer three questions. First of all, what's the motivation here? What's going on behind what Ananias and Sapphira are doing? What, what can this, does this story tell us kind of as we read between the lines? What is their motivation? Why are they doing this? That helps us understand why God dealt with it so harshly. So we need to understand that. But secondly, we need to understand why we need to pay attention to this story, why God included it for us to hear. Again, God's not afraid to show us uh, all the trials and tribulations of the church, whether they're stuff they dealt with from the world persecuting them or stuff that was dealing with in their own midst. So why do we need to pay attention? Third, we're going to deal with this question, well, how do we find hope from a story like this? How are we to draw encouragement from this? And believe me, there's lots of encouragement that we can draw from this very story. So these three questions, let's dig into it and uh, explore a little bit of this this morning. So what is the motivation here? What's going on that would lead Ananias and Sapphira to do this thing? Well, again, if we go back in the story to the last part of chapter four, we see that this is what's happening in the church and, and people of great notoriety like Joseph, who the apostles have nicknamed son of encouragement. They're selling their land. They're giving the proceeds of it. And these people see, they see the church is growing. They're part of the church. They see Bar people like Barnabas are giving generously. And Ananias and Sapphira, this husband and wife, they want to be part of what God is doing. They want to be part of it. And what did they really want? What they really wanted is they wanted to be accepted. <laughs> they wanted to be appreciated. They wanted to be lauded. They wanted to be respected. Just like you and I want. We want this from people. If we're honest. We don't want people to hate us and not respect us and think small of us. We want people to respect us and, and, and think of us a certain way. They wanted to have the respect that Barnabas had. And so the problem here, the motivation here is it's all about appearances. They're selling their property. Yes, they're contributing it, but they're reporting an amount that they actually, that they're giving that actually is less than what they actually make because they kept back some from themselves. There's a little bit of greed there too, isn't there? But this is all about appearances. It's all about a picture of a greater commitment than the, what there actually was behind the scenes. Again, no one would have been the wiser except that God is looking in on the hearts of these people. God cares about what goes on in the church. He cares about what goes on in the finances of individual people and couples and families in the church and how that connects to the community. He cares. Now, right in the middle of the story, we see Peter confronts them. And Peter says in, in Acts chapter 5 about this, he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, that's interesting, right? Because now Satan is introduced in this picture. Peter has correctly uh, analyzed the situation that, that there's a dark element behind all of this. Satan is trying to bring harm to this couple, to the community. And Peter recognizes there's an there's a underbelly of this, a dark spiritual side. Now, that's really interesting. we got to think about that because really this is the first of two usages of the word Satan in the books of, book of Acts. Now, the word Satan or Satan in the Hebrew, as it got carried over in, in, this, in the language of the original uh, Bible, in, in the original New Testament, means adversary. That's what the word actually means. Satan is adversary. Uh, the Apostle Paul will later call Satan the, the God of this world. He's a deceiver, and he's the accuser of the brethren. He's known as the destroyer. Now, it's very interesting, because remember, Luke is the one who's writing the story. And the last time Luke referred to Satan was not in the book of Acts, but it was at the end of the Gospel of Luke, and it was at the point where Jesus turns to Peter 
and warns Peter and says, he calls Peter by his given name, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. In other words, Satan wants to whittle and, and destroy Peter down like you would sift wheat. And here now in the book of Acts, Peter is confronting Ananias and saying, you don't realize Satan what, is at work in you to destroy you like he was at work in me to destroy me? And you're giving yourself over to the work of Satan by this? So that's, that's crazy to think about. That's that connection there. And it just goes to show you that Satan is all about eroding and destroying the church. If he can't do it, by political pressure or religious persecution from the outside. He'll try to destroy the church from within through compromise, through things that we would consider to be relatively small sins like falsehood and pretending. But you see, Luke doesn't see a contradiction or conflict between the active role of Satan here in filling Ananias' heart and Ananias placing the evil plans in his own heart. Did the devil then make Ananias do this? No, the devil didn't make Ananias do this. The devil can only do what we uh, open ourselves up for the devil to do. The devil just exerted the influence on this couple that they had allowed into their hearts. So when it comes to motivation, what are we talking about here? Here was a couple who wanted the approval and the recognition of the community. And they wanted it so badly, they were willing to compromise their very spiritual lives and then physical lives to try to pull off a pretend show of generosity. Now that's scary. And it should make all of us take pause. So think about it. Here's the point that's, that, we're, that God is trying to make in this story. God is so serious about the sin of spiritual inauthenticity. And that's what is happening here. These are people who are being absolutely inauthentic. They're pretending to be more generous than they are. They're actually holding back for themselves. They're wanting appreciation. They're wanting respect. They're wanting attention. God is so serious about the sin of spiritual inauthenticity that we need to be aware of the ways in which we can be inauthentic. And we need to seek his grace in order to walk honestly and with integrity before one another and before a watching world. This is why we should pay attention to this story because the danger is a very real danger, as real as it was back then, it's as real as it is today. We still do this. We still can be uh, hypocrites in this way. We can still be pretenders in this way. We share in Ananias and Sapphira's sin when we attempt to create the idea among other people that we're more spiritual than we actually are. How do we do this? Well, sometimes we pretend that we're people of prayer when we're really not as devoted to prayer as we pretend to be. Sometimes we pretend that we have it all together in our lives, even though we actually don't. Other times we could pretend like Ananias inspired to be more generous with the things we have than we really are. It, some of us even at times can pretend to be more morally pure when we're actually really struggling. Now that's important because spiritual inauthenticity is a serious sin as we see here. It's a serious sin. Why is it a serious sin to God? Because the community is a serious priority to God. Spiritual inauthenticity is a serious sin because community is a serious priority. And God knows, he doesn't see us just in our isolated sins. He sees how it affects other people and our sin always affects other people. I have yet to be convinced of any particular sin that anybody can commit that doesn't end up having collateral damage. And we certainly see that as the case here. When we pretend to be more spiritual than we are, then it's a lie. We're lying to one another. We're trying to lie to God. We're even lying to the community out there. And guess what? What is it that the outside world often criticizes the church? Criticizes the church from being pretenders, from being fakers, from being pretentious. 
brothers and sisters, here is a, a wake-up call that God cares about us being authentic and genuine and real. We don't have to put up appearances. We don't have to put up the show. It's not just about lying to the outside world as bad as that is. It's about lying to one another and trying to lie to God. Of course, we can't lie to God. God sees through it all. And lying to God is, is a serious offense. It's not a trivial thing. Now, sometimes we, we think, we can easily look back in the, the word of God and think that, man, God makes a big deal out of what would to be us to be small things. There were a couple of sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, back in the book of Numbers. They decided to improvise and burn an incense in the temple that, or in the tabernacle that they thought was okay when God had not authorized that incense to be burned and God struck them dead. Why? Probably because the incense they tried to offer was one that was associated with a worship of other gods who aren't really God. And God didn't want people to get confused. So he struck them dead. It was serious. It was maybe a small thing, just incense. But to God, it mattered because God had said, this is what I want. And they decided to do their own thing. Think about another man named Uzzah, who was a, a priest helping to convey the ark from the land of the Philistines where it had been captured back to the nation of Israel. And as it was on a cart, which it shouldn't have been in the first place, being pulled up by oxen, they, 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 they got onto some rocky road and the ark was about to fall off the cart and Uzzah reached out and touched the ark, which he's not supposed to do. And God struck him dead there. You think, well, he's trying to protect the ark from falling on the ground, right? It's not bad. No, the problem, and the great, late great R.C. Sproul who used to say, the problem is that Uzzah thought that his hand was less unclean than the ground. And so it's just a reminder that God sees and it matters to God. And there's no such thing as trivial when it comes to the things that, that God wants in our lives. He doesn't make big deals out of small things that are really small things. In every case we see, especially in this case, what's at stake here is God's own reputation, his holiness and the holiness of his community. And that matters a lot. You see, this is what we should realize when we come to a story like this, that God cares. He cares about what's really going on at churches like First Southern or this church here, West, the church at West Franklin in Tennessee. He cares about his church. He cares about the lives of people. He's not pleased when we fake it. He's not pleased when we put on airs and pretenses. It offends him because he's a holy God. So this is not God being just overly harsh because what's at stake here in this story at the very beginning of what we call the church, the history of the church, what's at stake there is still what's at stake. It's still important. The very soul and heart of the church, which is supposed to be the body of Jesus and it's supposed to represent Jesus to one another and to the world. The spiritual inauthenticity and pretenses is at odds of the very character of God. God is not pretentious. God doesn't put up fake and false fronts. And he doesn't want his community to look like that either. Again, what is the main complaint or what is often a frequent complaint of, of a world that doesn't want to dark, darken the doors of church? They feel like the people there will judge them and they're just acting it out anyway. They're not being real. So, Let's be gracious that God is gracious. And today he just doesn't strike everybody dead who fakes it. And I mean, honestly, I would have been struck dead lots of times uh, if, if God was consistent in this way. But God is gracious to people, fallen people like this. So why does he do this here? Well, again, the church is at its very beginning. The, and this is so, so important to get it right. And for the people to know that God takes this community seriously. That's why this happens here in this early stage in the life of the church. So God may be gracious with us today. And aren't we glad because we would have to have morticians in employment in the church if you weren't. But let's remember that even Paul talks about the fact that people not taking the Lord's Supper seriously got sick. God judged them and, and they became sick and some even died because they were careless. They didn't really put any thought or attention or they were putting on an act. 
And God won't tolerate that. It's important. So, <clears throat> how we, we've talked about what's going on, the motivation. We've talked about why this is such an important issue. Uh, but now, what do we do about it? How is it that we can have hope given this situation? Is there hope here for people like Ananias and Sapphira? People like me. I can be like Ananias. Uh, I can be a hypocrite. I can be an imposter at times. I can, what we used to say back in the day when I was growing up, a poser and a pretender. You know, there's hope for hypocrites and imposters and posers and pretender. And this is what we need to remember so that we can walk with integrity and we can walk with honesty before one another and before the world. Let's remember something. And this is really important to remember that faking it, it's exhausting. Trying to keep up appearances is so draining. You know what I mean, right? We try to, when we get around people, we try to be like something we're really not. That's pretty exhausting. It's pretty stressful. It's pretty anxiety filled. Over all the years that my wife and I have been at church, and again, uh, we're guilty of this at, at times as well. But we've seen a lot of people who've come in and, and from the outset, their family, they seem to have it all together. They seem to be the perfect model of spirituality. But then we start to see the cracks in that armor and we start to realize there's a lot of difficult things going on. These people are just not being honest. They've learned to uh, change their appearances, to become somebody else when they're around the people of God. When in fact, they're completely... More, it'd be more healthy for them just to be who they really are. So think about it. Faking it is exhausting. And Jesus calls pretenders to repent. Now there's this at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. God has these messages. The first three chapters of Revelation, God gives messages to these seven different churches that are in what we now call the country of Turkey. And in one of the places called Laodicea, he, he, he tells them, look, you guys, I, I wish you were hot and filled with passion, or I wish you were just completely turned off to me, because then I could deal with you. But instead, you're kind of tepid. You're kind of lukewarm. In other words, we can't really get a read on you. Sometimes you look like you're doing well, but you're really not. And, it, and that's no good, Jesus says. And he says this in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16 through 20. He says, so because you're lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. That is just like when you drink coffee and you're like, oh, that's, it's not, it's either be iced coffee or be a hot coffee, but don't just make it room temperature. That's no good. Maybe some of you like room temperature coffee. I don't. So they'll spit you out of my mouth for, for you say, I'm rich. He says to this church, I have prosper. I need nothing. Not realizing, he says that you're wretched, pitiable poor, blind, and naked. You say you're one thing, but you're really another. You just can't see it. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so you may close yourself and the shame of your nakedness and may not be seen and salve your, to anoint your eyes so you may see. In other words, God is saying, come to me. I'll give you what you really need. You think you have it all together? You don't. You need me to have it all together. You're trying to have it all together in your own power. That's never the way to have it all together. Then he says this, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. You know, I've discovered again in all the years of, of pastoring, I've discovered that the people who try to keep up appearances and are really kind of faking it to try to make it in time, the act collapses and, and they end up being seen for who they really are. And all that work, that all those years of, of trying to keep that together, it just isn't worth it. Thankfully, I see a lot of people come through that and understand what it really means to be humble and be honest before the Lord and depend on his grace. And God says, look, I, I'll bring you to the point where you're at the end of yourself. And I, I love you so much. I won't let you keep that up. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Sometimes we talk about this verse as a, a, a way in which people can respond to the gospel. Jesus is knocking on the door of our hearts for, us to, for him to let us into our hearts and, and become Christians. But really the verse is taken out of context. This has to do with people who are being pretenders. And Jesus says, don't you see him knocking the door? I want to be in your life. And you faking it is keeping me out of your life. 
That's so important to hear, isn't it? Because all of us can get that way. There's not a single person hearing me today that can't be in a place where you're kind of faking it. And you're really not being real before God. And you're not being real and honest about where you really are spiritually before others. And maybe it's because you're just afraid of the shame, maybe because you don't know who to trust. But let's remember what the gospel is. That Jesus loves fallen and broken rebel sinners like you and me. None of us had it together. If it was up to us to brush ourselves up and clean ourselves up enough for God to accept us, nobody gets into heaven. But God loves us so much that he doesn't ask us to do the impossible. Instead, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to live the life that you and I could never live, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins, to be resurrected so that he could offer new life to us and forgiveness and a way to actually grow without the fear of shame, without the fear of rejection. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to fear being rejected by God. When we come and are honest about our spiritual bankruptcy, God is pleased to fill us with all of his goodness. Being honest. Do you realize that it is so exhausting to fake it and Jesus calls the weary to drop the act? He says this in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, which has been so dear to be meditating on for me in my own life in the last couple months. He says this, come to me, all who, are, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, Jesus says, upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Are you tired? Maybe the act you've been putting up that really begins when you get in the church parking lot or begins when you show up at the house where the other members of the church are. It's just wearing on you, and you're tired of it. You're worn out. Listen, Jesus knows that, and he invites you to come to him. He can give you rest. So drop the act. Be honest with God about where you really are. That's where it begins. And then ask God for grace. Now, this is encouraging to us. I know it's a scary story. God strikes a couple dead in the church who are given a lot of money. Well, we assume it's a lot of money, but yet it's not honest. So where's the grace? Where's the hope in that? Well, let's remember there's no perfect churches. Even the church of Jerusalem had people like this, right? There's no perfect churches. If you think you're going to go out there and find a perfect church, guess what? If there is a perfect church and you join it, it suddenly has become imperfect, right? So let's remember that. There's no such thing as a perfect church. You're never going to find it. It's filled with broken people. The church, again, is not a museum for saints, as someone once said. It's a hospital for sinners. It's where we go to be real and to help one another apply the healing grace of God to our lives so we can walk in integrity and honesty without the fear of needing to put on the act to put on the fronts. So we need that. We need to keep that in mind. We need to remember that, that God won't let us go on with it. He loves us too much than to allow us to live in this act of pretending. So let's give up the act. Let me give you a couple of things to think about here. Here's some questions, because here's the question that you need to think about. And this is a good question to ask yourself a couple times a week. Am I actively promoting the idea that I'm more spiritual than I really am? Am I actively promoting the idea to myself, to the people that are closest to me, to those outside who don't really know me? Am I actively promoting the idea that I'm more spiritual than I actually am? What a great question to ask yourself. And ask the Lord, Lord, search me, know me, try my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me, the psalmist says in, in Psalm 51. Am I trying to, am I pretending that I'm more than what I actually am? Now, here's some steps to take. Number one, examine your motives. This is something that Ananias and Sapphira should have done. They should have stopped and said, no, wait a second. Why are we doing this? Why are we trying to pass this off as we're being so generous when we're actually holding something back? Why are we wanting that? It's so good to stop and ask yourself, why am I doing this? 
And ask the Holy Spirit to show you because sometimes we're blind to it. Why am I doing it? Let people into your life that are, are willing and you're willing to take the risk for them to be honest to you and say, you know, why are you doing that? You're doing it for the right reasons. Examine your motives. Remember the gospel, right? God loves us. He created us. He wants to be in fellowship with us. But we are fallen because we've chosen to go our way and not his way. And there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. God loves us, but he has to judge our sin. But because he loves us, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to, to come and, again, live the life we can live, die on the cross for our sins, to be our substitute so that he can restore us to new life, to live that new life now and forever. So rehearse the gospel. Remember what it's really about. It's not about pretending. It's about being real. It's about being honest. It's about accepting the bad news so we can take the good news. Thank God for his grace and his mercy and his love and his patience and his discipline. Don't, don't chafe at that. Get somebody in your life who will help you take stock of your life. It's so important to have people like that in your life. If you don't know where to begin with that, talk to Pastor Chad. Uh, you're welcome to talk to me. Talk to any of the leaders of this church. They would love to help you get on track. I know it. Then lay the results before God and, and repent. That is, do a 180 when it comes to things that God shows you. He's, he's not pleased with. These are not the things he wants in your life because he knows they'll ruin you. Let a text like this speak to you. It's good to remember that God cares about what's going on in the hearts and minds of his people. Let me close our time in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you again for this text. As hard as it is, it reminds us you're serious and you know what's going on in our hearts. And we want to receive that message because we know there's grace behind that. Well, you don't scare us to scare us, Lord, but you show us that you are a holy God, a consuming fire, and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a God like you who sees through all the pretenses. You want a community that's honest and authentic and real. Lord, that's so hard for us as human beings to do. Lord, help us to work through that. For those that are really struggling, Lord, show them your grace and your mercy and your love today, that you want them to be real and honest. Lord, we love you and thank you for your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here today at First Southern. We hope that through today's service, you have been taken further in your journey with Jesus. And again, if you would like to get connected, if you've got questions, maybe you would like uh, to ask some questions about Jesus or make a decision for Jesus. There are two ways you can connect with us. Go to our website, click the contact us page. We'll have someone reach out to us or reach out to you or uh, text the word connects to 94000. Either way, we would love the opportunity uh, to be connected, to get connected with you. Now, First Southern supports many uh, church planters, international missionaries, and nonprofits. And one of those missionaries, international missionaries that we support is the Miller family. And today we have a wonderful update video from the Millers in Southeast Asia. So please enjoy today's update from the Millers. What's up for Scottsdale? It's the Miller family living here in Southeast Asia. And we want to give you a snapshot of what our lives have been like over the last few months. But before we do that, I want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads uh, this month. We have Father's Day here. It's a national holiday and we celebrate it much like the same as in the States. A couple of differences is that kids will light a candle for their father and we celebrate it in December in honor of the King's birthday. So what have we been up to? Well, last month was Easter and we had an incredible opportunity to share the gospel with more than 50 people in the two villages we attend. We've heard that the COVID restrictions are easing a little bit in Arizona. Well, not so here. In fact, they've been enhanced. But even during that time, we were able to pack uh, food boxes with our Thai church and deliver them to these villages. And also in no small part, due to your generosity, we were able to do that. We've also been prayer walking in an area, strategic area downtown, close to the red light district in hopes of a future ministry site. We do this on a weekly basis. And we have gotten settled into a new house in a new neighborhood. 
For the summer, my mom is having a college intern come to help with her ministry, and I'm super pumped to hang out with my friends for the summer. In our Thai church, my dad has been preaching in Thai from John chapter 9 about the blind man, and I feel like I was able to understand the most. We've had another great school year, even though most of it was online again. All of us kids have had their birthdays this year. Mine was today, my mom's was this week. We continue to work on our language development so we can share the gospel in the heart language and we pray for more groups of intercessors praying for Southeast Asians and that God will give us opportunities daily to share the hope that we have within us. Pray for us when God brings us to your mind. Pray that we would abide in him, that we would have opportunity to share the gospel with Thai people and we would remain faithful. And once again, we want to say happy Father's Day and how grateful we are to our great Heavenly Father. Bye. What an exciting update from the missionary family, the Millers in Southeast Asia. Uh, now I want to give you some updates and some announcements of things that are going on here at First Southern. Uh, first, I want to remind you that our Vacation Bible School is coming up very shortly. It's next month, so go to our website, click on the Events tab, and you'll find all of the information and the registration for your children uh, at that location. You can always reach out to us if you have more questions. Mark your calendars. We are planning a trip uh, to the land of Israel. It's going to be next year on April 25th through May 6th, 12 days total. The cost for this trip is going to be $5,000. It's all inclusive. Everything you need is included in that. But the first deposit for this trip is due on August 1st. We will be sending out an email this week that will have a brochure with information about the trip, along with dates for a Q&A that we will plan. Uh, so if you've got questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us, but mark your calendars and look for that email coming uh, this week. Uh, we are also continuing to take donations for our Serve Scottsdale initiative. This is the initiative that we began at the beginning of COVID. Uh, it has gone to support our local food bank, uh, helping our homeless community, helping uh, elderly individuals who are at risk, and helping churches that are going through difficult times as a result of COVID. Uh, but we got an update today from our food bank. We've been told that they uh, are doing well with food, but they are in desperate need of bottled water water. And so if you'd like to help us support our local food bank by dreaming, uh, dropping off uh, bottled water, you can do that this week, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, so please be generous, uh, drop off some bottled water, and we will make sure that it gets to our local food bank. Thanks again for joining us today. If you've got questions, get connected with us, but stay safe, stay uh, connected, and stay strong in your faith. God bless and have a wonderful week.